Oh, now I got it. How's the sound now? <laughs> oh, my God. I am sorry, guys. Hello, Renan in Brazil. So I just realized that I had my audio off. So this is <laughs> this is already turning out to be a great day, isn't it? Um, so let me see who's already chimed in. And then I will go back to what I was saying and start over again. Not anything that incredibly important, but uh, shared. Thank you, Renan. Uh, how are you doing? How you? Uh, well, I'll tell you how, how I'm doing in a second. But uh, overall, I'm doing pretty well. Hope you are too. Uh, thumbs up. And uh, yeah, I figured that out in a few seconds. Okay, no sound, no sound, no sound. Okay, but now we have sound. Cool. All right. So uh, yeah, so what I was saying was, is that um, last Thursday when I was doing the live stream, uh, we had Alex Jeffries come and then we had some technical difficulties with the problem uh, with the camera. And so we ended early and uh, I didn't realize that Alex was planning on leaving the next morning. And so that night was the only time I had with Alex to actually help him with his uh, launch. And so uh, that's what I did. But I was already feeling kind of tired and I was hoping to go to bed early and uh, I ended up staying up late with Alex because I had a lot to say about his launch idea. And uh, because of that, uh, it kind of tipped me over the edge and I got sick. And uh, normally, I get, you know, I get sick every once, every several years, four or five years, I guess. Um, don't get sick very often. But when I do get sick, I generally get very, very sick. And this was no different. Um, I really, uh, generally what I do is I'll take like NyQuil and I'll start pounding it every two hours and I'll just sleep like 18 hours to try and get my body like a significant amount of rest all in one fell swoop. And that'll begin the process of feeling better. I couldn't fall asleep no matter how much NyQuil I took. And partly that was because my fever was spiking and I had a fever between 104 and 105 on uh, Friday, Saturday and parts of Sunday. So uh, got kind of crazy sick there. Um, didn't really feel horrible except that I had this fever and gave me the chills and I was sweating and feeling freezing at the same time. Uh, this week I've just been kind of taking it easy and uh, tonight will be no different. I'm going to take it easy tonight. We're only going to go for like a half an hour, 45 minutes an hour. Um, we'll kind of make it quick. I wanted to talk to you about pattern recognition. Also just wanted to, I didn't want to lose this habit. Like, you know, right now I'm not working out. That kind of bothers me so much. Uh, it makes me feel very antsy and, uh, I have all this like additional energy that needs to go somewhere. So canceling this too would just be too much. But, um, I've been spending, uh, some time, uh, when I, you know, in passing, uh, studying pattern recognition, and I'm just really fascinated by it, and I think you guys should be too. And so I'm excited to just talk to you about it here for a little bit. It's not something that I think we'll go real deep in tonight, but it is something I'm sure that we'll revisit sometime in the future uh, as I start acquiring and accumulating and consolidating the notes that I put together for it. So uh, pattern recognition is, um, I, I just read this article actually, and it is it's not on the topic of entrepreneurship, nor necessarily pattern recognition. It's about a type of attention, but um, but it's a good article, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm very tempted to uh, read it to you guys, and um, maybe I'll do that if I can figure out a way to um, to share it. I still gotta do that delete of Evernote from my computer that I'm actually broadcasting from so that I can reinstall it because every time I try and open it, it fails. So let's see who's with us. Um, and let me get past the no sound. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you do seem quite animated. That's funny. Um, all right. Uh, okay, great. All right. Okay, hear me now. Pretty cool. Uh, now it's good. Okay, sound is on. Hello, Dr. Vogelman in Coronado Island. Yes, uh, audio is okay. Hey, Renan and Dr. Vogelman. I'm feeling a little bit better. Um, never really felt that horrible. Just tired, not uh, my strong, vigorous self, I guess. Um, hey, Lisa in Miami Beach, good to see you. And good to see you, Tina, uh, as well. And hey, Daryl, good to see you, my friend. And James in San Diego. 
Uh, the, the temperature is down now. Um, thank God. Uh, I had to, uh, I had to, I probably went through like six to eight t-shirts a night. Like while I was sleeping, every time I woke up, it would be soaking wet. Uh, good immune system test pattern. <laughs> uh, wow. Is it really? So yeah, well, I'm glad then I didn't experience any brain damage. Um, you know, the highest I saw was 104.5, but um, I'm sure it even went higher than that, but not that much higher. So, you know, it bounced around between 104 and 105, but uh, it's 104.6, I think. One, But, you know, I'm kind of hallucinating too during that. I am already feeling better and it's now just a question of time. Although like, man, I just like, I, I so want to work out. Like I just feel so much better when I'm working out. And, uh, I know right now that would kind of not be good. So I'm just itching to kind of get going, you know, uh, hello, John from Maine, seven, three, eight, two. I assume that's your Colby score. Uh, good to know. Uh, Priscilla, is that how you pronounce that? Priscilla, nice to see you in Zambia. Wow, very cool. Uh, yeah, me too. I hope I do get better. Tell us a story. I will. Uh, glad you're doing good. Thank you, Jason in Tampa. What did we miss? Uh, you missed me just complaining about being sick, so you didn't miss much. Uh, hi, Peter in New Zealand and Mike Lee in New York. Thanks for letting me know that you're hearing me clear. Um, <laughs> no, that was on my, that was two different thermometers just to make sure. Uh, hey, Jamie, good to see you in Palm Beach and Max from Coral Springs. Wow, we got the Florida contingent in the house. Thank you, Zam. And uh, Cole Gordon is actually going to be uh, in town tomorrow, or so he tells me. And so we'll be getting together. Actually, we're going to be going uh, to Mark Ford Cigar Bar. And uh, by then, hopefully, like I've got that's two more days worth of anti two and a half days actually of uh, more of antibiotics. And so by then, hopefully, uh, I will be good to go. I started the antibiotics on Sunday. Um, all right. So let me read you this article because I thought this article was fascinating. And it really just kind of, I think, cues up certain elements of um of pattern recognition and what like what goes on in the brain a little bit. And I think, uh, so this, this article is uh, how experts think. And it is, I guess, an essay that was, that Kevin Ashton, that's the name of the author, um, he took it from his book, How to Fly a Horse, which is all about how experts think. So here is the article. Um, I wish I could pull it up, and I promise that by the next time I do a live stream on Tuesday, I will have my Evernote back in place. A quarterback starting the Super Bowl is, on average, the 84th player drafted. This is based largely on his college career, so why are some quarterbacks more successful professionals than they were in college? A quarterback has the ball for about 90 seconds each game, during which time the best quarterbacks make seven successful passes per 10 attempts. The worst quarterbacks make five successful passes per 10 attempts. Those two extra passes are mostly a result of faster thinking and faster thinking is mostly a result of faster, of better studying. How fast does an expert quarterback think? He has less than one second to solve his first problem. How many opponents are trying to stop him from throwing the pass? Three or four is normal. More than that is a blitz, a metaphor of war taken from the German tactic of overwhelming force called Blitzkrieg. If the quarterback sees a blitz or if the line of teammates protecting him has been breached, he must make a quick pass, take evasive action, or sacrifice himself to keep the ball. If he judges he will survive, he moves on to his next problem, where and when to throw. Potential receivers are spread across the 160-foot wide field running planned assigned routes. Each route includes an agreed-upon moment when the receiver will turn and look for the ball. The quarterback must gauge each receiver's prospects. Who is in pursuit? Who can interfere? His decision is based not only on position, but also on speed and direction. The fastest receivers run 19 miles per hour, faster than an Olympic sprinter starting the 100 meters. 
The quarterback can throw the ball at 50 miles per hour. He must predict what each receiver's situation will be when the ball arrives. He must think about this winning. He must think about this while moving and avoiding collisions and with an obstructed field of vision. If he takes a fraction of a second too long, his options collapse, opponents converge, receivers exhaust their routes. On most plays, he has fewer than three seconds to make a decision and to act. It's kind of interesting, and I'm not even a football fan. Uh, he cannot see what we see. 21 men engaged in danger and chaos. He can only notice the important things, and he must decide what to do about them almost instantly. For example, we didn't have much to lose. This is a quote. The clock was running out. I kind of saw a defensive coverage, and I figured it's tough for the safeties, the rear defenders, to move in those conditions. It was snowing. We wanted to try and get Rob Gronkowski, a potential receiver, up the seam into the space between the front and the rear defenders. And then outside there is, oh, this is going to be too difficult. All right. But it's a whole long paragraph. And basically those thoughts took less than two seconds. The result was a 60 yards of forward progress for a touchdown. How does a quarterback think so fast? We can understand that by looking at other disciplines like quarterbacks, radiologists are experts in seeing things quickly. What is invisible to us is obvious to them. They can diagnose a disease after looking at a chest x-ray for a fifth of a second, the time it takes to make a single voluntary eye movement. As they become more trained, they move their eyes less until all they have to do is glance at a few locations for a few moments to find the information they need. This is called selective attention, and it is the hallmark of expertise. Adrian de Groot, a chess master and psychologist, studied expertise by showing a chess position to players of different ranks. He found that grandmasters evaluated few moves and reevaluated them less often than other players. One grandmaster evaluated one move twice, then evaluated another and played it. It was the best possible move. This was generally true. Grandmasters never considered moves that were not one of the top five best possible moves. Other players, considered moves as poor as 22nd best. The less expert the player, the more options they considered, the more evaluations they made, and the worse their eventual move was. Less thinking led to better solutions. More thinking led to worse solutions. Were grandmasters making their moves by inspiration? No. Experts do not think less. They think more efficiently. They, they, the practice brain eliminates poor solutions before they even reach the conscious mind. Grandmasters have not been grandmasters forever. When they were masters, they played like masters, evaluating more moves more frequently. When they were expert level players, they played like expert level players, evaluating even more moves more frequently and so on. By evaluating so many moves, grandmasters accumulate so much experience that they can selective, that they can pay selective attention to a game. The same is true for an elite quarterback. Like grandmasters, the best quarterbacks experience as many games as possible, not just by playing and practicing, but also by studying other quarterbacks, past and present, at games, on television, and most frequently on a video database called Coach's Film. One scout describes the best quarterbacks this way. They just have great anticipation to throw through windows that aren't there, but they are going to open up through study. Advanced thinkers think in advance. The expert's first impression is not a first impression at all. It is the latest in a series of millions. The more we learn from our experience and the experience of others, whether in chess, radiology, football, or anything else, the more selective our attention will become and the faster we will think. So I just thought that that was a really good article, kind of like explaining that as we recognize patterns, our ability to think speeds up tremendously because what we can contain in a thought uh, dramatically increases, right? What's contained in a thought is dramatically more because so much more can be put in a thought by that higher level of expertise because of the patterns that are recognized. So I, I don't know if, if I'm, I don't know if you guys find that interesting or not. So let me check in with you guys. And um, you know, the, the basis of most AI is some kind of pattern recognition. Now I'm so like, even when I'm doing my research, right, I have to 
sort out for most stuff about pattern recognition these days is about uh, software and machine learning and AI. Um, but I want to understand better how experts are able to do what they do. What allows me to be able to size up a marketing process very quickly that takes others a really long time, right? And my belief is, is that it's mental models, it's distinctions, and it's also um, pattern recognition. In fact, you know, some of the best SEO people I knew back from my days in Black Hat SEO in like 2003 and four, um, they were extremely good at pattern recognition. They would notice the pattern that, you know, the top ranking pages that they would notice all had in common. And, and they would be able to very quickly figure out, like, they would be able to see things I couldn't see. I was not good at this type of pattern recognition whatsoever. Um, but they would be able to very quickly, by looking at a bunch of pages, uh, ranking highly in very competitive fields, be able to very quickly figure out the pattern of what's making these pages rank high. And so, you know, if you've ever traded the markets or you're a day trader, you know that pattern recognition is incredibly important in that field as well. And it's just my belief that effective entrepreneurs um, are noticing patterns that other unsuccessful entrepreneurs do not notice. And so, yeah, let's see what you guys have to say. And then we'll kind of, I can take it further. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 I'm just scrolling back up. Don't want to miss anyone. Um, all right, let's see. I'll be better. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, so we did those. Um, cool. Uh, yep, did that one. Thanks for the well wishes. Um, hello, Red Lip Marketing in Columbia. Thanks for the well wishes. Hey, Cam Fats. What is new, my man? Long time no speak. Uh, love to talk to you at some point. Maybe uh, maybe in mid-November. Like I'm uh, got a week. I got next week, a couple of days, and then I actually head out to uh, MFA, uh, their top one mastermind, uh, Todd Brown's group. I'm going to hang with them. Uh, for a couple of days, Kim and I, uh, Kim, my girlfriend and I, we're going to hang out with them for a couple of days. Uh, then we come back, we have Halloween. And um, then a couple of days later, I go to Cabo um, with those of you who bought and Amber Spears' uh, mastermind in Cabo. I'll be there. And then I'll be in Vegas. And uh, the guys at Strike Point would like me to go to California after that, but I think I'm going to go home because I really want to, don't get sick again, especially after I date well. And that's a lot of travel. Uh, but good to see you, my man. Uh, Amit, Rich, what is your opinion on all these expensive masterminds? My thinking is, is that it's better to pay for a specific question problem than to pay 25K for generic mastermind. Well, look, you know, I don't think that there are generic masterminds. I think that each and every type of mastermind has their purpose. Um, whether that purpose is good for you or good for me kind of depends on the situations we're in. Um, there are certainly masterminds that people join and really their goal is one deal, uh, one JV, one affiliate relationship that will easily pay for the whole, you know, for the whole mastermind. And that is a function of like the size of your business and everything else. Um, I think that, I think that people, different people get different things out of them. I used to be very dismissive of masterminds. I'm not as dismissive anymore because I see the value of having a peer group. And for many people, they don't have a, a, a group of peers that are kind of operating in the same space at the, around the same level. And uh, they pay a price for that. And uh, so this is a way to plug into a group of people. Um, and then, you know, Todd is one of the best out there, if not the best out there at really laying out a funnel and making that funnel convert to cold traffic. And so if that's an area where your business really is dependent on, then being in Todd's mastermind makes a lot of sense. If your business is doing a lot of affiliate type of marketing, then Amber Spears is one of the best in affiliate marketing. In fact, uh, I'm super excited that Amber and I are getting closer uh, partly because I want her help in building, helping me and helping Michelle and helping the rest of the team at Strategic Profits really build out an insanely great 
uh, affiliate program for Steal Our Winners as we launch our new platform. So, you know, when I did a mastermind, mine was like an anti-mastermind. And uh, my goal was not for you to leave with 25 good ideas. My goal was for you to leave with one idea. But, um, but that was just my slice on it. And uh, yeah, you know, it all depends. You know, it's not something that I've done a lot of them. Uh, I haven't. I've only done one year, one time. Um, but, uh, but I, don't, I think that there's, I used to be, I used to think what you thought on it. And I don't think that anymore. I think it has its place. I don't think it's the solution for a lot of people's problems, but I do think it has its place. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vogelman. You're the man. Long time. Hey, Stefan, your neck looks more buff than ever. My neck. Uh, well, I was in phenomenal shape about a week ago. Um, then I got sick. That's when I, I just can't wait to just get back to working out and stuff. Uh, Blitzkrieg, overwhelm speed and force. Yes. I uh, love this article. Awesome analogy. Cool. Uh, that sounds a lot like my beloved Buffalo Bells. Uh, Rich, what is butterfly marketing and how much input and influence did you have in developing the concept? I had zero input and zero influence on that. That's Mike Phil Sains. Uh, I was Mike Phil Sains coach during that time, but I wasn't coaching him on marketing methodology that like he invented. No, no, I was, it was much more business stuff than that. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, what what the genius of butterfly marketing was is that it was a way to, you were giving something away for free that people could get for free, but had value in it, like it could be, it was being sold. So it was like bypass that, you get it for free. If you wanted like the upgraded, then you, you took the upsell. And if you took the upsell, right, your affiliate commission was higher. You would find that out when you went to the next page. So some people went back and then bought it. And as soon as you bought it, you were also an affiliate. So it was this way of giving something away for free. So people came, some took the upsell, they became affiliates, they would promote, right? And it was like this ongoing, never ending, continual new affiliates, continually new affiliates promoting, uh, very effective strategy. Um, and uh, it's actually the way Mike Filsain grew, like first 30 million in sales for Groove, I think, came from like a butterfly process. Dude, max respect for doing your live stream while not feeling well. Awesome dedication. I, you know, I just don't want to get out of the habit. It's too easy for me to fall into routines, but thanks for noticing. Uh, it's what pros do. The show must go on. Yes. <laughs> too much analysis can lead to paralysis. Therefore, your ability to read at 3x times I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, found the article. Yep. Yes, that is the article. And for anyone who wants to check it out, I wasn't trying to hide it. So uh, by all means, check it out and read it. Uh, nice share, dude. Cool. Uh, like the Gretzky comment of going where the puck is going to be. Yeah, of course, that's what we all aspire to, right? But like everything is a pattern in life. Um, and, and so the ability to spot them is part of like, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's so blatantly obvious that part of the part of expertise is the ability to spot patterns that um, that give you information, one, that make it easy to predict, two, and also open up what the best solutions are, three. So, and I'm trying to like break that apart a little bit. Uh, our, our, Yes, you know the answer. Our conscious thoughts are faster. Interesting, interesting. Uh, this article is fantastic, so valuable. Thank you, Rich. Totally resonates with how can we be more valuable to others? Where can we find the article again? Uh, it's up in the notes here. Uh, it's a Medium article, and it's How Experts Think by Kevin Ashton. There you go. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, Let's see. All right. Okay. Please define your version of Black Hat SEO. Uh, my version of Black Hat SEO is basically um, not following Google's rules because Google does not make the rules. Google makes the rules for Google, but uh, Google has violated the law countless times. 
And uh, so I don't really respect Google's rules because they don't respect the government's rules. They don't really respect anyone's rules except their own. So uh, I know some people think of like Black Hat SEO as being like so horrible, but you're just breaking a company's rules. A company that has been caught doing a lot of illegal things over the years. A company that has done so many things illegal that if you or I did them, we would go to jail. A company that built a search engine with the whole like promise that we're going to scrape copyrighted content We'll build a search engine off it, and then all that traffic will go back to you. So you, everybody's content that's copyrighted that we're stealing, don't be upset about that. Well, you know, fast forward to today, and Google does sends less than half, less than half the people that go to Google for a search leave Google properties. So, yeah, so they break their rules all the time. They break their promises all the time, but. So if I'm animated on this, it's just that I don't think there's anything wrong with Black Hat. Uh, the only thing I think is wrong with it these days is that it just doesn't last very long. But um, I could care less what Google's rules are. Um, I don't think they care very much about what you think or what I think. And so that's what I think. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Pattern recognition experience makes a difference in a fraction of a second timing. And you're making decisions all the time, right? Uh, very interesting. I had a similar experience with word search and able to see words in split seconds works. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm an accounting major and, uh, and so generally I can spot problems on spreadsheets, like by just looking at the entire spreadsheet, whereas other people get lost in them, but that's just cause I've had so much experience with it. Right. And, uh, if you think about like, that when I was at Agora, right, like Joe Schrieffer, who many considered at Agora Financial really being a guy that could tell you whether co any copy would work or not and had ideas of consistent winners, pretty consistent. Um, you know, there are he the way he recommended learning copy was to break it up, like break apart every paragraph, like what's its purpose. Right. And then create outlines off that. And what he said is that you'll find that they're the very same outlines like throughout, which means that copy is a pattern and most and there are like six different patterns that a sales letter can take and they'll generally go down one of these paths and they're different outlines and uh that's where like the copy boarding well that's more on the objection side but so the blueprinting is the first but my point is is that most people might not think of copywriting as a pattern but it is and so if you can master those patterns your ability to write copy, your ability to judge copy goes up dramatically. Uh, Rich, isn't it really the experience of doing it over and over again for years? Well, that is, Jamie, the default way to make it happen, right? So no doubt, some people are born with a smart, a faster, not smarter brain, a faster brain than others, right? Um, there are people who I am smarter than but whose brain works faster than me and can solve problems like better than me in a shorter period of time in areas where we both don't know anything um, and vice versa. Right. So yes, you will develop. If you put in 30 years or 40 years worth of practice, you will eventually develop and you're successful. You'll eventually develop the mental models of that success you will develop the distinctions of that success and you'll know the patterns, whether you know them consciously or unconsciously. The, that happens automatically over a long period of time if you're successful. My thought is, is that why leave that to like just happenstance? Isn't there any way that we can expose the distinctions that experts have uh, and learn them earlier in the process? Can't we use those distinctions to create our own mental maps so that as we then experience things where we have a reference point, we're not just like starting from scratch. And then with that, like, can we get better at pattern recognition so that we don't have to wait those 20 or 30 years, but we could actually spot patterns much sooner and faster and therefore be more effective. But yes, Jamie, your, your answer is yes. The reason to look at it is to see if we can do it better, faster, and quicker, and can we teach it, which is, I think, challenging, but that's one of the things that I find fascinating, too. 
Does that mean the more someone can study a subject, the better patterns they can recognize, which means if someone reaches mastery on a subject, it becomes easy to recognize patterns that others can't see? Yes, it does mean that they will recognize patterns that others can't see. Um, the, some of these patterns, though, can ultimately end up being unconscious because, right, like the expert's dilemma or whatever that's called, where, you know, a lot of times experts can't break things down so simple because they can't get their head out of what they already know. Um, these things become unconscious, right? Like I can't tell you the patterns I recognize for when I'm talking to an entrepreneur that lets me know, uh, I think this person's a winner or I think this person is going to struggle, but those thoughts come up. Right. And if I paid more attention, I might be able to figure out what those patterns are. But there are things happening in the background for me that have been based on years of work, right? But um, but they're not, they're at my own command, but they're not at my ability to instruct. And that's a very common thing, especially as it relates to pattern recognition. I've been reading that at least. Um, isn't that like having blinders on when you're so focused on a topic, you can see things clearer than most? Sometimes you can, sometimes actually a very um unfocused allows you to see patterns actually better because you can see the whole forest right like so but you're certainly your attention given right um is a function of one having blinders on right but but putting those blinders on and you're like internally rejecting certain pieces of information and just focusing on those things that are critical right and um, when you think about a football quarterback, I've never really, uh, I played like football, like junior varsity in high school, but that was about it. And I was a lineman. So uh, I didn't really uh, get to think about the quarterback and what he was thinking about that often. But um, yeah, it's a lot to kind of process in a very short period of time. Uh, yeah. I, you know, there's crossover, but the question is, is like, what would allow you to be better at spotting opportunities in your market? What would be better? Like, what, how could you do that? Right. Um, how could you figure out like where the holes are in your market better? Where can you spot them? How quickly, like if you knew what to look for, um, what does, like, what do most of the customers that do business with you, what do they have in common? What's the pattern there that is not obvious, but when spotted can actually make the difference in growing your business? Uh, I did do COVID tests and they both came back negative. Uh, very, it's very much related to what uh, Malcolm wrote about in Blank. I need to get into good habits. Well, you know, you do one thing different, John. Start with just one thing different. That's all it takes. Uh, how important is repetition? Well, I think for pattern recognition, it's probably pretty important, but um, I really just wanted to, uh, <laughs> I really just wanted to uh, surface it and then talk to you about a couple different parts of this. How can someone spot mental patterns that lead downward? We mostly deceive ourselves. Is something, if it's uh, deceive ourselves, if it's something leading to out of comfort. Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, Hamza, one of the ways that I do that is I try to outthink myself. I, I recognize, so, you know, it's a great question and I'm glad you asked it because like I was talking about this earlier today on a, uh, on a Zoom call uh, with Felicia Pagesh and uh, some of her clients. And, um, I think that most people, uh, give themselves too much credit on how different they're going to be in some short period of time. And because of that, they don't set themselves up to succeed. So what I mean by that is that I know that my future self is going to be as distractible, as lazy, uh, um, prefer to do a lot of other things um, than maybe sit and work on my notes in Evernote, right? Like just as an example. So I try to do my best to outthink my future self. What I think most people do is think that their future self is going to somehow be better than they are today. 
So in other words, like if you get distracted and you got to think about, you got to identify like what distracts you and then you have to get that out of your space. Right. So it's like, you know, when I was talking to Ivaldo, uh, one of the top copywriters for Agora, like he gets distracted by his phone. So he always leaves his phone downstairs and writes upstairs or he writes upstairs and leaves his phone downstairs one way or the other. Right. And he knows that he like he knows that his normal self will pick up the phone when feeling frustrated. So he leaves it downstairs so that it's no longer an option. And that's understanding the pattern that leads to failure and making sure that you don't run that pattern. Right. So that's different than being able to spot patterns out in the world. Right. But, but certainly I think most people make the mistake of giving their future selves too much credit that they're going to be better, more focused, more willing, more committed, whatever than they are right now. And that's, I think their biggest mistake. I have no illusions of that. I'd love to be 10 times better at a lot of things. But if tomorrow I'm no better, how am I going to make sure that I actually do better even if I'm no better? And that has to do with outthinking yourself. So I try my very best to outthink my flaws, right? That was why I named the product Outthink Your Flaws. And it was all about like all these different strategies that I've used for perfectionism, procrastination, um, and like 10 others, right? And it's all about recognizing that you can set up your environment. Your context has a tremendous impact on you. So like leaving your phone downstairs is a function of your environment. It's no longer available in your environment. Um, going to a Starbucks or um, using a, a computer that it's not hooked up to the internet or you know whatever it is, working towards a timer. These things are all elements that may or may not work for you. But it's important to understand where you do veer off course and how can you outthink yourself right now so that when you're not in that situation to make that not happen, if that makes sense. So that's my answer to you, Hamza. But great question. I took a two-day assessment called the Highlands Program. It showed that I scored very high in pattern recognition. I think it makes me a really good suitcase packer. <laughs> I think it probably makes you good at a lot of things, Dr. Vogelman. Uh, I love your Google rant. I so agree with you. Uh, cool. Yeah, I just, I went on that rant because like some people think black hat SEO, like, oh, like you're breaking laws or something. Uh, yes, I know they will. They already have numerous times. Uh, what are the six copywriting patterns? Oh, like a systems promo, a predictions promo, um, different types. And then these promos are written very differently. Um, but since I am not a copywriter, um, that is not my sweet spot. Um, therefore still able to hit the golf ball down the middle at 88 years old. Not as far though. Yep. Probably. Uh, perhaps your second, your sound cut again. Are you serious? No. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, good. Um, thanks for introducing me and my husband to profit singularity. We started to see amazing results. Rhonda San virtual workshop for entrepreneurial women was insane. She is something else. Well, great, Emmy. Glad to hear that. Um, Dave Asprey had the same take on hormones. Rather than leaving fate there, he asked, how can I affect change my hormone levels? Yep. Uh, so same with me. I'd, um, my hormones, like I started taking testosterone in, when I was about early 30s. And I was told by my doctors that I had a low testosterone in my 20s. So I, my testosterone's always been low. And uh, yeah, uh, all knowledge and expertise are at the basis about uncovering and defining patterns. That's what I believe. I think a lot of it is, I don't know if it's all, but I think a lot of it is. Uh, the leapfrog concept you talked about last week really spoke to me. Oh, cool. Rich, are you not concerned when you write on Evernote that what you wrote is not private anymore. Rich, are you not concerned when you write on Evernote that what you write is not private anymore? The only thing that I write that's totally private is what I write in my journal. And that's what's locked in safes. So, and it's in paper. So everything else I assume can be read, will be read by someone at some point in time. Profit Singularity is, our, is now our jam. Thank you for having Rob on. He answered more of on your live than even their own webinars. Wow, cool, very cool. So let's see. Um, so believe it or not, human beings are the world's best pattern recognition machines, but the question is for how long? So that's an article that I have not yet read. 
Um, that was interesting. Um, let's see. Um, let's see here. Oop, what's wrong one? Okay. Um, looking for a different one. See which ones would be interesting to share with you guys. Figured I'd share another one and then, uh, I don't remember if this was good, but this is like, this is, yeah, this was good. Okay. So uh, this one is uh, another Medium article. The title is On the Importance of Pattern Recognition um, by F Federico Pistano. Um, and here it is. I've been thinking a lot lately. I observe myself staring into the void or looking at other people's faces, movements, behaviors, I listen to their words and I have a strange and distant feeling of the outerness, but what, I, what am I thinking about exactly? I think about thought. In particular, I ask myself the reasons we do anything. Really, why do we do anything? Why do we wake up, grab a cup of coffee, have children, work, watch films, take hikes? Why do we do anything at all as opposed to nothing? I've been so caught up with the everyday to-dos that sometimes I get the feeling I'm moving in autopilot mode but I don't really question why I'm doing what I'm doing. I believe this to be one of the fundamental questions of existence. The first answer that came to mind is evolutionary, and it's probably the most obvious one. Certain instincts, physical and behavioral traits were selected by for, were selected for by the process of evolution, and now we exhibit them without necessarily having a reason other than random chance, natural selection, and time. But then I thought about it some more. And I came to the conclusion that life is about patterns and living beings value pattern recognition more than anything else. Think about it. What makes a gazelle successful? It must spot lions and other threats effectively and efficiently, react in a split second without wasting energy. Based on the limited information it has available at any moment, it must act accordingly. Spotting the line requires sophisticated vision, auditory, and potentially olfactory systems, all of which are intensely focused on recognizing patterns and raising the alarm when a specific one is spotted. Activating the muscles and beginning the complex process of moving four coordinated limbs to propel the entire body forward while staying in balance is another case of pattern recognition and execution, coupled with a feedback loop of the body's response, which leads to another state which requires more pattern recognition and so forth. In algorithmic terms, it's a recursive function, albeit simplified. What makes a person successful? It's the same exact process, pattern recognition and execution based on the understandings of such patterns. You can pick any field or endeavor. You can apply the same reasoning and arrive at the same conclusion. Why do we cry at Pavarotti's performance of the Aria Nessum Dorma? And I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong and I apologize. From the final act of, God, more uh, Giacomo Puccini's masterpiece, Tur Turandot, which I know some of you probably know what that is. Uh, we see Luciano, uh, Luciano's deep, intense eyes staring into infinity as his vigorous tenor voice vibrates powerfully. It resonates with our mental patterns that recognize the fluctuations of harmonic waves intertwined in timeless mathematical proportions, which seem to peer into the birth of the universe and its remnant vibrations thought the cosmos that we inhabit. Ludwig van Beethoven wrote that music is the one incorporeal entrance into the higher world of knowledge which comprehends mankind, but which mankind cannot comprehend. The relationship between music and numbers is well known. Pythagoras understood it over 2,500 years ago, stating there is a ge geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spaces of the spheres. Why does Bill Gates have a fortune more than $80 billion? One can always point to luck, and there certainly was some of it in the early days, but without his ability to see patterns in the market, technology, and consumer behavior, he would not have consistently increased his wealth over time. We value patterns more than anything else. Virtually every single job on the planet is based on how good someone is at recognizing patterns and to act accordingly. In fact, we spent our formative years learning the most important patterns. It's the meta pattern that which helps us understand and form new patterns. 
Our ancestral DNA gives us instincts, which are forms of pre-programmed pattern recognition that helps us survive. But before we can do anything more meaningful, before we can use our mind and body to create something new and useful, we need the meta pattern. We learn how to learn. And learning is fundamentally about pattern recognition. We are pattern remix machines. We copy, we transform, and we combine to create new and interesting patterns, which others find valuable and insightful. Let's take a field of study and research, which is generally seen with merit as much more noble endeavor than making money hard sciences, physics, math, chemistry, biology, etc. What makes Edward Witten's research more valuable and interesting than thousands of theoretical physicists struggling to achieve academic notoriety? Clearly, it's his ability to see complex patterns which others don't. Physics is all about patterns, and math is the language we use to describe such patterns. How can we ever hope one day to defeat dementia? Alzheimer's disease, and hundreds of types of cancers, if not by understanding the mechanisms of how they emerge, spread, and die, and isn't this yet another form of pattern recognition? The internet is giving us unpre unprecedented access to information and knowledge, which is sometimes overwhelming. Take this article you're reading right now. Why did you decide to click on it? Perhaps you found the title interesting or intriguing and wanted to know more. In other words, you recognized a pattern which sparked neural connections in your brain that led to the creation of a more complex, interesting pattern, which you found more compelling than the last cat video you saw and decided to keep reading. You are now in the 14th paragraph. Was it worth it? Is it creating new pathways and making you think differently? If you're still here at this point, the answer is probably yes. If the pattern is too simple, too obvious, we find it boring, uninteresting, or banal. If it's too complex and chaotic, we find it confusing gibberish. Valuable patterns are sophisticated enough to be interesting, but simple enough that they can make sense. It's not just science. It's art is about patterns, too. Vincent van Gogh's prodigious mind produced in 1889 what is now one of the most iconic and recognized works of art history, The Starry Night. But his unparalleled genius became even more evident in 2006 when physics discovered that Van Gogh's painting, Starry Night, accurately described one of the most mysterious and still unexplained concepts in physics, turbulence in fluid flows. The great German physicist Werner Heisberg once said, when I meet God, I'm going to ask him two questions. Why, re why relativity and why turbulence? I really believe he will have an answer for the first. Scientists have struggled for centuries to describe turbulent flow. Some are said to have considered the problem harder than quantum mechanics. It is still unsolved, but one of the foundations of the modern theory of turbulence was laid out 60 years later by the Soviet scientist Andrei Kolmogorov in the late 1940s. Quote, the Van Gogh creation during his most turbulent period mirrored nature's turbulent flows, as if his mind somehow tapped into the universal archetype where lumin luminous becomes numinous, and the painter's brush and the nature become one and the same. That was a quote from Andrei Komagarov in the 1940s. <laughs> If art is about patterns, so is psychology, sociology, physiology, making a movie, writing a book. A language is a form of codified and organized patterns, which helps us transfer a mind pattern, an idea, thought, an image, an emotion to someone else. It's a pattern-based technology, a vehicle whose purpose is to translate pure patterns, thoughts, to other pattern-seeking entities. Our drive as a species is to understand and share patterns is so strong that we independently invented this language pattern thousands of times over the course of a few millennia. We value patterns so much, we put the majority of our effort and attention in making sure that they are not lost. We write books. We use math to discover laws of the universe. We record plays, songs, stories, etc. Patterns. It's all about patterns and recognizing them. The more elegant and intricate the pattern, the more beautiful our braid in space-time is, and the more satisfying our existence. So these were both general articles. I have articles as they relate to entrepreneurship. I didn't really want to go down that road today because first I just wanted to share some thoughts about pattern recognition and hopefully get you just a little interest, more interested. 
and maybe the next time you come across something about pattern recognition, you'll recognize that there is a lot of pattern recognition going on in your day-to-day -day life as you operate an online business. And uh, if you're a coach, you're always looking for patterns, right? In the, within a person, like, are they running that pattern again? Or like, are they running a general pattern that many people who go a certain route may run? So uh, let's check back in with you guys. And then I think we'll call it an early night unless like someone gets me going on a rant of some sort, which I hope not. Um, okay, that was that. Yes. Cool. Cool. Uh, cool. All right. Um, life experiences add to discipline and action orientation to perform helps. All those things help for sure. Action orientation is critical for sure. Um, uh Great Leads by Mike Palmer. And I think Mike Palmer wrote that or might've been Jack Ford uh, and Michael Masterson or Mark Ford. Uh, great Leads though. What app do you use in Mac for speed reading? By the way, do you still read like crazy or did you find the book, which <laughs> finally released your book addiction? Um, I, uh, I don't read on my Mac. So I read on my iPad and I'll use Voice Dream. I still like Voice Dream the most. Um, my friend Todd... Uh, introduced me to this other app, but it's just more difficult to get books in and off of it. Um, so yeah, I generally, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see any good reason to speed read on my Mac. I mean, I will, if I'm speed reading, I, I, I will read an Evernote. So that would be the only exception. But if it's like a PDF or it's a long Evernote, I'm, I'm, I'm printing it out generally, unless I plan on highlighting it and then I will read it on in my Mac. But generally, most of my reading is on my iPad. To recognize a pattern, you need, you need to be a very narrow specialist, which goes very contrary to being a broad generalist required for being an entrepreneur, in your opinion. No, I don't think to spot patterns, you don't have to be a narrow specialist. Um, not at all. Um, in fact, right, like I like many of the patterns I've noticed are not even patterns I do. They're patterns I see people do or patterns I've done once, notice it, identify it, and never want to do it again, right? So like uh, phantom profits is one of them. So phantom profits are when you work, when you are, when you're so scared of losing profits that don't exist that you hold back on doing something because you sacri you'd be sacrificing these additional profits that currently don't exist, right? So the story I have about phantom profits is that Todd Brown and I, when we used to work together, we spent like three weeks on this crazy upsell downsell path that on this front end that we couldn't wait to release so that we could have this front end, this upsell and downsell path. And, uh, we released it and the front end did not convert well, which meant the three weeks on the upsell and downsell path was a complete waste of time. We would have known that had we sold the book for a day <laughs> um, if we were willing to forego these phantom profits. So that was a learning lesson for me, right? I call that, I, I labeled what... Uh, we were too scared to sacrifice phantom profits. So we ended up wasting three weeks of our time. I would have much preferred to have sold for a day, turned it on and off, no matter how much we would of extra sales we would have lost, even if it was a success, but it, it wouldn't have been. And then we would have known right there and we wouldn't have wasted the next three weeks. And time is all that you have in this world. And so phantom profits is something that happened to me one time, right? but I have a word for it. So it is a uh, distinction for me and I can spot it and I can spot it in my clients. So that like, that's a one-time experience that I using some of the tools that we've talked about distinctions, right? I was running, it was a pattern, right? A pattern of trying to optimize something before it's even been validated. And yeah, distinction. And it's in a mental map of what to avoid to be successful. I uh, hope that helps, Emmett. Uh, the best poker players probably learn how to break their own patterns. Yeah, 
Sure. Sure they do, James. And I've played with some of them, not for any big money, um, but uh, they could guess what hands, what I, the best poker players play you. They're not playing their cards. They're not playing your cards. They're playing you. And um, when I did a bunch of projects for the World Poker Tour and Howard Letterer and those people all the way back um, early 2000s, uh, I got a chance to play with some of them and they were just so good. They're scary. Uh, take him to see a few operas. The operas you mentioned are some of the best. Yeah, I don't even know if Kim likes operas, but I'm... Uh, the only operas I've ever, this is like, maybe this is so low class and I apologize if it is, but the only operas that I've enjoyed are the ones, like I think it was at the Met um, in Manhattan, but they had a tele, like a teleprompter or teletype kind of thing on the bottom that was converting it all to English. So at least I would understand the story. Just sitting there listening to people sing uh, and not like, yeah. Um, how can I recognize all my patterns? I think I have blind spots. Well, we all have blind spots. And, um, and my purpose on patterns, like, is not so much on the, on the personal side to identify your own. I think to do that, I, I think writing in a journal is probably the most powerful thing that you can do. I mean, it's what I've been doing for 30 years. But I would say that uh, where I'm, I want, I think there are patterns that allow you to identify what's an opportunity and what's not. I think there are patterns of to getting things done quickly and getting them done well. And that there are patterns to how like people carry themselves and what other people quickly surmise about those people based on that. Um, those are the ones that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the patterns that make up expertise and how can they be identified and then kind of taken or given. Right. Uh, about the second article, does someone who have ADD who get bored quickly by doing something has a great pattern recognition? And wait, does someone who have ADD who gets bored quickly by doing something has a great pattern recognition in a way that he can easily predict what's going to happen next? Um, I guess so. I guess so. Great Leads is the name of the book. Who is the author? Uh, Mark Ford, but I think in that book, he, he might either goes by Mark Ford or Michael Masterson, I don't remember. And it's either Jack Ford or it's Mike Palmer. I don't remember who wrote the book with Mark. Uh, being able to have a 35,000 view is sufficiently broad to recognize patterns that most people miss. I agree. Phantom Profits, Ghostly Gains. <laughs> uh, I got it. Subtitles are special, are super helpful in opera performances, not low class at all. Um, how do you come up with great ideas in general? Is it by recognizing patterns with different domains, like coming up with something from the music industry? I don't know, uh, but I'll have more to tell you about that, Hamza, next time. Uh, <laughs> I think if I think if you expose yourself to lots of ideas, it's a lot easier. So if anything, I'm an idea hunter more than I am. Uh, anything else and I can spot good ideas how much time a day would you allocate to journaling to get the momentum it's not so much about that you know what Stephen if you just told yourself you're going to open your journal every day and you're going to start writing and you're going to spend at least five minutes writing just five and after five minutes when the timer goes off you can just shut the journal or you can keep writing I will tell you that some of the best entries I've ever written in my entire life were times that I started by saying, I don't even want to be writing right now. I think I'll just write quickly and I'll kind of wrap it up. And then I would like fall onto something. I don't think it's about how much time in a day. I think it's more about the consistency. At some point, you will find it very easy to open up in there. And uh, in the beginning, you can just, I don't even know what to say right now. This kind of feels like a waste of time. Uh, I wonder where this will all lead. But you will find very quickly that um, I think that my experience has been, and certainly most of the people I know who, who write it in the journal, is that it's a very cathartic. And it, once you get into a rhythm, it's very easy. And the only thing that's required to get into a rhythm is to open it up on a consistent basis. Yes, exposure and immersion to good ideas is like 
So important. All operas have subtitles. Sub, oh, do they? they uh, <laughs> um, yes, consistency. That's what it's all about, Stephen. So like I said, guys, I really appreciate you guys being here, especially on a day that I am not at my best by any stretch, uh, but didn't want to like get out of the habit, especially since I wasn't here on Tuesday. Um, I'm hoping to be fully recovered by this Tuesday. And um, I'm looking forward to actually... I think I'm sharing, um, yeah, so Tuesday I'm going to share either three or five. I don't remember what the team made me promise. But um, my top three or top five most influential favorite self-help books that I've ever read in all time. So uh, they're making me have to work a little bit. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about on Tuesday. I'm going to share those books. I'll share some of the notes of those books and I'll tell you why those books impacted me as much as they did. Um, and so I'm actually looking forward to looking through all the books that I've read and kind of really thinking about it. I generally hate, uh, ranking the books that I've read. I feel, I don't know. Um, I just love reading and I love books and I don't like kind of thinking about it that way. I mean, I have my favorite at any given moment, but, uh, of all time is going to be difficult. So uh, anyway, that'll be Tuesday from two to four. And uh, until then, uh, stay healthy. Uh, I will get more healthy and to higher profits beyond Rich Sheffern over and out.